I've been reviewing the history of the Graham Supercharger, and we're about to dispel the myths and give you the true facts of the development of this unique device. October 29th, 1929. Known as Black Tuesday was the greatest and in fact worst stock market crash in the history of the United States. It is in a unique way an impetus for the development ultimately of the Graham supercharger. It changed for everybody how they were going to live their lives, how every business was going to exist or not exist, and in fact ultimately changed the entire planet because of the depths of the Great Depression. This caused the Graham Page Motors Corporation to change course from what it had done in its first two years of existence and go on to develop a number of interesting items during the 1930s, probably the greatest of which was the Graham Supercharger. Graham Page in 1928 had constructed a brand new engineering building. That engineering building was constructed next to its administrative offices directly in front of the plant on Warren Avenue in Detroit, Michigan. That engineering building was equipped with the latest and greatest of all features so that the company could produce the greatest cars possible. This included a cold room which could go to minus 47 degrees Fahrenheit and had a giant fan which would allow up to 35 mile per hour winds to be directed at a car or a piece of equipment. It also included a hot room which would go up to 140 degrees so that they could test the high temperatures relative to the operation of their automobiles and equipment. It also included silent rooms where they could run items and actually determine exactly what amount of noise was created and what specific noises came from what parts of the actual operating piece of equipment. Now, Graham Page also had something else that was particularly amazing. It had one of only five stroboscopic rooms in the entire country at the time. This was a French-provided series of lights and equipment that allowed Graham Page engineers to use stop motion relative to any single mechanical device they were working on. This engineering building, along with the offices and other laboratories necessary to develop various pieces of equipment for Graham Page motor cars, put them very much at the forefront of the industry, even though they are one of the smaller automobile manufacturers at the time. This unique situation gave Graham Page the ability to develop something later on as amazing as the supercharger. As mentioned previously, the 1929 crash caused a major change in Graham Page's fortunes, just as it did other auto manufacturers. From 1929 to 1930, they had a huge drop in sales of automobiles. 1929, approximately 62,000 cars were manufactured. In 1930, just over 30,000 cars were manufactured. This is a net drop of in excess of 51% in one year. They were not alone. The auto industry experienced this throughout all the different makes, whether they were independent or whether they were large, such as GM, Ford, or Chrysler. This is part of the reason, again, for the impetus of the supercharger. Graham Page, run by Joseph, Robert, and Ray Graham, decided that there were several things they were going to do, one of which they were going to push for amazing styling, two, they were going to develop a smaller eight-cylinder engine, and third, the most amazing thing they were going to attempt to do was develop a supercharger for a medium-priced car. The idea that the Graham brothers had of producing a supercharger was considered a far-fetched reality when we were talking about putting on, on a medium-priced automobile. In 1929, for example, the Stutz Motor Car Company offered a supercharger as an option on its vehicles. The cost of the supercharger, $1,500. This particular price is in fact more than many Graham Page automobiles cost for the entire automobile. So people in the industry thought, 
this was not possible. There were three types of superchargers that were potentially going to be possible to put on a car. They had all to this point been utilized either on racing vehicles or, as I've already mentioned, on cars that were quite expensive in the luxury class. The three types of superchargers that were possible were the vein, the roots, or the centrifugal. When the Graham brothers decided to produce a supercharger, they went to their engineering department, then run by Lewis Toms. His assistant chief engineer was Floyd F. Kishline. Floyd F. Kishline, as we are going to see shortly, is in fact the father of the medium-priced supercharger that could actually be sold on a car like Graham. We are about to go through the actual history of how this was done. In 1931 was when the Graham brothers made the decision to go ahead with this project. The first mention ever of the possibility of a supercharger for a medium priced car was in 1931. This is one of the few things where we cannot say other than it was in print that we know for sure it was Graham Page that was actually going to do this. It is in fact one where their name was never mentioned, but no other car company ever produced a medium priced supercharger at this time. So this is most likely true that this was a reference to the beginning of the Graham supercharger development program. Floyd Kishline had been with the Graham Enterprise since 1919 in various capacities. You see, the Graham brothers were not just in the car business. They had previously been in other businesses, related and somewhat unrelated. But Floyd Kishline had joined them back in 1919. Here by the time in 1931, as I said, he is the assistant chief engineer at Graham Page. Lewis Toms assigned him to be the head of the team that would actually develop the Graham supercharger. Kishline's design for the supercharger was based on a Switzer Cummins design that had been done for Duesenberg, Switzer Cummins being part of Ford's empire. Lewis Switzer happened to be a very good friend of Floyd Kishline. It is more than not unreasonable to figure that Floyd Kishline had access to information for that particular supercharger. The Graham supercharger, though, differs in many ways. The Switzer Cummins unit was not designed with the idea of being either quiet or relatively inexpensive so it could be on a medium priced car. The Graham supercharger, by dint of what was necessary to be on a medium priced car, as well as what the Graham brothers themselves wanted the I end unit to be is quite different. In the Graham supercharger, plane bearings are used versus having roller bearings utilized in the Switzer Cummins unit. Also, a completely new form of gearing was developed, which maintained more teeth in contact, getting rid of the single most annoying point in a regular supercharger, which was a large gear wind. One of the single greatest things done to develop the Graham supercharger was that Kishline and his group worked with Bonn Aluminum and Brass in Detroit to actually come up with a new alloy to make the supercharger rotor out of. Traditionally, supercharger rotors had to be cast and in machined many times over and were very expensive to produce. The alloy developed with Bonn Aluminum and Brass was good for 50,000 pounds tensile strength per square inch. They were actually able to make a single mold that allowed them to cast the rotor as one piece and negate almost all machining on the actual part. This brought the cost of the rotor down tremendously and was one of the major contributions to making the supercharger possible for a medium priced car. Additionally, as I mentioned, the gear wind problem was solved by working with another firm. The special gearing was developed with the Machine Tool Company of Detroit. And as I said, it is a multiple tooth gearing system that allows more than one tooth to be in contact at all times, known as a cone gearing system. This actually reduces the sound in the supercharger precipitously in giving us a supercharger that is almost unnoticeable, something that the Graham brothers particularly wanted the unit to be. They did not want one of their drivers to get in the car and to constantly be aware that it was a supercharged car. They did not want the public to realize when the car drove by that it was actually supercharged. However, they want the benefits of a supercharger. Hence, the gearing was extremely important. Now, between the rotor, 
and using a high quality hardened shaft of special design that the rotor ran on and the special gearing, they were able to spin the actual superchargers in their laboratories for 100 hours flat out at 45,000 RPM. This is far above the actual operating RPM in the car, which is more in the neighborhood of 23,000 RPMs, or in other words, they have a virtually 2 to 1 safety margin in the unit. The Graham supercharger actually operates at 5.75 times crankshaft speed. As I mentioned, this gives a potential top RPM of the rotor at 23,000 RPM. However, what did the supercharger do? It increased horsepower by 42% on the new Graham 8-cylinder engine. It also caused an increase in gas mileage, 5% at low speeds and up to 17% at high speeds. It also atomized the fuel far better than was in a normal carburetor, again resulting in better combustion and more horsepower development with less stress on the actual engine. It also did one other nice thing. You could actually start the car far easier in cold weather than you could on a car that was not supercharged. Those who have driven a 1930s car, this would have been quite a feat at the time as you often have to know the exact procedure for your car, set the choke just right, know how many pumps you have to give it, and then run it for some time with the choke on until it reached full operating condition. The actual supercharged engine in a 1939 Gram, as I own, only requires a crack of the choke for just a moment, and you can usually shut it off in under 30 seconds and drive the car away. That's because of the supercharger and how good it is at a cold start. Graham Page worked on the supercharger from sometime at 31, as we know, all the way through 33. It was not until the end of 1933, in the New Year's Eve edition of the New York Times newspaper, that Graham would announce the supercharger. In the meantime, during 1933, Graham had tested numerous automobiles with supercharged engines installed on their own test track right there at Warren Avenue in Detroit for many hours on end to make sure that the unit operated just the way they wanted to. Between the New Year's Eve mentioned in the New York Times and the January 6th opening of the New York Auto Show in 1934, Graham Page via Robert Graham, who ran the sales department, handed out supercharged grams to a number of people in the automotive press and allowed them to actually drive and experience the car. As I said, the car was introduced with a supercharged engine in 1934, January 6th, New York Auto Show. Floyd Kishline was asked in March of 1934 to present a paper on his supercharger development for Graham Page used on the new Graham automobiles of 1934. That extensive paper was presented to the Detroit Society for Automotive Engineers. This is essentially a club as well as a working group of all engineers from the various automotive companies. It is very hard, if not completely impossible, to believe that the society got it wrong and asked the wrong person to actually come present information on the supercharger and how it was developed. The reason that I am mentioning this is because in a moment we are going to cover one of the greatest myths regarding the Graham supercharger. Kishline's technical paper was considered so important that a abstract of it was published in Automotive Industries magazine in April of 1934. During the summer of 1934, Rolls-Royce contacted Graham Page to gain access to some superchargers for tests at their factory. The tests proved to be quite satisfactory. However, Rolls-Royce decided on a different direction for future motor cars, or they might have actually purchased them. Again, Rolls-Royce bought them from Graham Page, not somebody else, which in a moment will become important. In 1935, Floyd F. Kishline became the chief engineer of Graham Page after Lewis Toms moved on to another company. During his tenure as chief engineer, he and his fellow engineers adapted the Graham supercharger 
2 grams new 217.86 cylinder engine, resulting in a completely different mounting system from that of the 8 cylinder car. On the 8 cylinder car, it's mounted on the passenger side. On the 6 cylinder cars, it is mounted on the driver's side. Graham Page did not apply for a patent for the supercharger, interestingly, until January of 1936. In fact, January 11th. It was granted on November 9th, 1937. Let's look at Robert Paxton McCulloch and his superchargers. Robert Paxton McCulloch founded his first company in which he made superchargers in 1937 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. His original company was called McCulloch Engineering Company, and as I said, it was in Milwaukee. His supercharger, which is also a centrifugal design, is made to operate on top of a Ford V8 engine. It is an aftermarket item, and it is radically different as we're showing you now in pictures from the Graham supercharger. Now we know for a fact, and history supports it, and as I'll cover in the book I'm holding shortly, that there is absolute proof that Graham Page's supercharger precedes the McCulloch supercharger by several years. That a patent was granted by the U.S. government to Graham Page. That the Detroit Society of Automotive Engineers recognized Floyd Kishlein as the inventor of the medium price supercharger and that it was done at Graham Page. And that it was further covered in a magazine article for an industry magazine merely a month later. All of the supporting information shows everything is correct that it was Floyd Kishline. There is no supporting information that can be found in any way, shape, or form that McCulloch was in any way involved with Graham Page or in any way had access to Graham Page's drawings, engineering, etc. Rather, the truth is probably more like this. Graham Page was selling thousands of supercharged cars across the United States. There was certainly a Graham Page dealer in Milwaukee. It is more likely that Mr. McCulloch actually looked at the Graham Page supercharger and said, hmm, I can make one that will fit a Ford and I can sell lots of them because there are so many more Fords. That is what actually happened. It is the opposite of what people report. There is no way that McCulloch manufactured any parts for Graham. As I mentioned, we've given you the two companies that were involved in two of the most important aspects of the engineering of the supercharger and manufacture of parts. Graham Page did its own engineering, its own manufacture, its own development of this particular unit. It has nothing whatsoever to do with McCulloch superchargers. And there are people, as you will find on the internet, sometimes deliberately trying to deceive you and tell you that they are related, which they are not. As to what would a Graham supercharger be worth? People often will ask me that. Well, Graham superchargers at this point, unless they're fully restored, are worth about $75 to $200. If you're paying a huge sum, such as $1,700, $1,000, you're overpaying for something. Because the reality is they almost always need to be completely rebuilt at this point, especially if somebody is trying to be in them themselves and work on them. When we look at the actual superchargers, I'm going to give you a little bit of information on why you don't really want to try and take it apart yourself and why it's actually better usually to have one that's frozen than one that somebody's tried to take apart. Rampage Motors Corporation utilized the supercharger from 1934 to 1941 on Graham produced automobiles. After the war, Graham Page did also make the Fraser automobile. There are no Graham superchargers ever used on the Fraser automobile. The information that we have presented in this particular video almost exclusively comes from Michael Keller's absolutely fantastic book, The Graham Legacy, Graham Page from 1932. That's the book I'm holding. This is the one of a two volume set, the second volume, in which Michael Keller details supercharger development as well as the entire history of the company. These two volumes are still available according to Mr. Keller. You can get them online as ebooks. And in fact, the first book of the two volume set is also available in a print version if you're willing to pay for it. We gratefully acknowledge that Michael Keller allowed us the utilization of his 
photos and information from his book. We could not have done the video correctly without that. You'll find, if you pick up one of these books, that every single thing we have told you is footnoted or covered in the book, showing you exactly where you can look it up. And that what we have shown you about these superchargers covers the real reality of history and not the myth that they had anything to do with McCulloch or any other company. They're entirely a Graham Page invention. They are the reason you can get in my 1939 Graham get fantastic gas mileage, barely hear the supercharger, and go 100 miles an hour in a 1939 stock car.